Hello, I'm Joshua Gordon from the Sports Conflict Institute. We are live here with SCI TV. I'm very pleased to have a special guest today, Professor David Yamada from Suffolk University Law School, my alma mater. Welcome today. Josh, it's great to be with you. So your area of expertise, among many areas of expertise, includes bullying and workplace bullying. And when we talk about sports in the industry that I spend a lot of time in, this has become a major topic in recent years. And so my hope for us today is to spend a fair amount of time talking about this in a fairly deep way and understanding what can be done and, and why it's happening as well. It's a complex topic, and I'm glad we're going to give it some attention today, Josh. So, so my hope is that you could do a quick introduction about how you got involved in all of this. Uh, we don't need you know every moment in your educational background because that'll take us all the way till the end of our time. But just a basic idea of why this is an area of interest and why you've dedicated decades of work into this area. Great. Well, Josh, as you know, I'm an employment labor law professor, and about 15 years ago. I discovered this topic of workplace bullying and at that point it was just being introduced into the employee relations vocabulary of the United States. Um, I started looking at it more from a legal and public policy angle but over the years I've also uh, really delved deeply into the organizational and personal aspects of what this behavior does to organizations and to individuals. So. Um, I guess you could say I've become a generalist in a topic uh, of somewhat narrow but significant interest to people. So obviously it's been a problem going on for a long time. Why has it taken such a forefront in recent years, certainly in the public's eye? I, mean, I know you've been putting attention to it for a while now, but what, what has raised its awareness, do you think, at this point? Well, I think in the United States, when we've looked at how people mistreat each other at work, we've tended to center around issues of discrimination and sexual harassment. Um, and, it, and it fits with the fact that we have a much more diverse workforce in terms of demographics than many other nations. But over across the pond there in Europe and in England, um, you see the development of research protocols uh, looking at this sort of generic harassment, generic bullying and mobbing. And so it took a while for those ideas to sort of port over to the United States. And as I said about 15 years ago, thanks to the work of Gary and Ruth Namey at the Workplace Bullying Institute and a smattering of academics and activists and practitioners across the country, we're now starting to see the idea or the notion of workplace bullying becoming more mainstreamed in our discussions about workplace mistreatment. So it's been a bit of an evolution over the years and now I, I think is exemplified by uh, uh, this program we're doing together. The, the idea of bullying at work or bullying in athletics at various levels is becoming much more of a mainstream topic of discussion and certainly the media has seized upon it as well. So maybe a nice place to start is with a very visible case, which is the Miami Dolphins of the last year. The NFL, notoriously a very tough league, it's a tough sport, and people, I think, in some ways have a hard time empathizing, understanding that here could be a multi-hundred-pound lineman who could be vulnerable in their workplace. And maybe you could help us piece that apart a little bit, and also let's talk about some of the responses to that situation. Yeah. Well, football is a pretty rough sport, right? It, it's built on aggression. Uh, it's built on physical force. It's built on intimidation. Um, but even with those qualities in mind, there's a point at which the interpersonal behaviors can become abusive. And that's what happened in the Miami Dolphins situation. You had this offensive lineman, Richie Incognito, uh, known as a pretty nasty player. You know, I mean, those guys are, are, are trained to be pretty resilient, pretty tough. But even amongst that group, Cog Incognito was seen as being uh, oftentimes um, taking a step beyond what was considered appropriate. Um, and he directed it at a teammate, Jonathan Martin, uh, whom he didn't like. And it seemed to go beyond what you'd call the sort of normal hazing uh, that occurs in the National Football League and many pro and college sports, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, situations. Um, and it blew up. 
um, we saw what happened. Uh, it became a public story as uh, people dug into it. They saw that uh, Richie Incognito not only uh, directed certain behaviors at Jonathan Martin that had some uh, racial and ethnic uh, overtones with it and also were just, you know, plain cruel, um, but he rallied teammates to treat Martin in the same way. Um, and then, it, well, the Miami Dolphins, it took them a while to get on the right page with that and to start an investigation. The NFL uh, also was a little bit behind the curve uh, in responding to this. So uh, that gave it time to become a very press-worthy event. Um, and then uh, it, it led into the considerable coverage and discussion that we saw in the aftermath of it. So, so Jonathan Martin took a fair amount of heat for violating what's been long accepted as a, a code of silence when – you have issues on your team in, in professional sports or college sports. The, the norm has typically been to keep that in-house, deal with it among your coaches and your peers. And there are a lot of folks in the press and other teams who felt like he violated that norm. From a, a bowling perspective, what would be your reaction to that sense that he should have kept it quiet or dealt with it quietly and not brought people's attention to it? Well, in a culture that is... Uh, well, how should we say, hospitable to bullying. Um, the silence of the target or victim is considered to be part of what allows that behavior to continue. Um, now, I, I'm sure that the NFL has, you know, sort of these unofficial codes of silence in, in a lot of ways in general, but um, I think what triggered this one was the fact that the behavior started to shine a light um, on a, a culture that maybe had gone too far. And in Jonathan Martin's case, uh, it was clear that he was, um, I, I think he was ambivalent about the, the public attention being drawn to this. Um, and although I, I don't know this man, I've never talked to him, my guess is that he understood that it could have some implications for his playing career as well. Now, fortunately for him, uh, after he obtained his release from the Dolphins, he, he went to the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, I think he's starting right now for the 49ers, even though they're not doing so well. Um, but nevertheless, his career appears to have been saved. Um, I can't really say that's the same thing for all targets of bullying. In fact, a lot of people who are savagely mistreated in the workplace, and it doesn't have to be in a sports situation, a lot of those folks lose their jobs and even lose their careers. So um, Jonathan Martin landed on his feet, so to speak. I hope he's doing well in that situation, but um, I'm sure there are still a lot of players out there who might give him that extra hit out on the playing field because they just thought that he stepped over the line and, uh, you know, wasn't, quote, strong enough to take it. So um, uh, we'll see what the rest of his story is like, uh, but it, it appears at least there was some positive development in it, and uh, hopefully he won't be subjected to undue retaliation because of what he's done. Absolutely. What, what are some of the common risk factors that you – see whether it's in sports or elsewhere that set the stage for a very abusive work environment and, and to lead towards bullying? Well, I, I think it starts with the top. Um, bullying does not occur in isolation. Uh, it, it usually is enabled and sometimes encouraged by the culture of the organization, the profession, the vocation that one is in. Um, and in this case, again, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, a sport that is just, it, it's built on violence, right? Physical violence. And it's built on uh, interpersonal intimidation, right? Um, and so there's a fine line between when it's appropriate on the playing field and the practice field and when it crosses over into abuse. And so the NFL is sort of a, a hyper uh, uh, example of what happens when that culture trips that wire. But if you take it into other work settings, you'll find very much the same kind of dynamic, that in workplaces where you see a lot of bullying type behaviors, you're going to see a culture of, of the organization that simply enables that, sometimes backs it up, sometimes encourages it, um, and then uh, discourages people from reporting it and encourages sort of a bystander um, uh, blaming of the, the victim or the target. Are, are you at a point where you're able to 
to see an organization, even if there's not an active bullying situation going on, and say, wow, there's a risk here, given some of these factors? Or is it really wait till a problem happens, and then we can figure out why that happened? Well, I, I think if you had the power to go into an organization and conduct some type of an anonymous survey, uh, that survey instrument would certainly identify risk factors for bullying and maybe even uncover some instances of bullying depending on how that, that survey instrument is designed. Um, the problem is that a lot of organizations who might uh, be host to these kinds of behaviors um, are going to be reluctant to let third parties inside. Um, now, I have to say, I bet the HR folks within some of these organizations are well aware of what's going on because they hear those complaints and they oftentimes get sort of caught in the middle of all of them. Um, so, yes, it is possible to identify those organizations that are, you know, sort of petri dishes for this type of behavior. Um, and, uh, you know, we have to remember that uh, research indicates that when you have a, an organization where there's a lot of bullying type behaviors, you're also going to see other types of interpersonal aggression as well, ranging from sexual harassment um, to, uh, to, to physical uh, aggression at times. So uh, these behaviors don't occur in isolation. And in more dysfunctional, hostile organizations or organizations where there is sort of a cap put on expression of opinion and uh, sharing of opinions and, and filing complaints and things like that, uh, you know, there's sort of a powder keg ready to go off at times. Now, certainly the NFL takes a lot of heat for the situation with the Dolphins, but they're not the only group in sports that have had recent issues going on. In your own backyard, you had Boston University and their women's basketball coach essentially lose her job over allegations of bullying behavior, not between the teammates, but coming from her as a coach. We had something similar in Oregon at Oregon State University with Coach LaVonda Wagner, and you know all the things kind of mirrored each other where there were things like diet pills and lots of uh, harmful language and, and ultimately it came into play when folks started to vote with their feet by leaving. Can you help us understand you know, how it differs a bit when maybe it's a coach who's a bad actor and then also how it might be different when you're shifting to women's sports or the college level as well? Mm -hmm. Boy, there's a lot in that, Josh, and let's, let's try and sort of take it apart here. Um, First, in those situations, we're talking about college sports, right? And we're talking about high-impact, high-stakes college sports, uh, mostly at the Division I level. There's a lot of pressure to win. There's a lot of pressure to bring the fans into the seats. Um, you know, it's except for the players uh, getting scholarships rather than salaries, it's, it's, you know, pretty much a de facto professional game that we're talking about. So that's the setting. And then you bring into it some of these coaches uh, who have been, uh, how could we say it, uh, found their, you know, aggression validated, right? Um, they've moved up the ladder. Um, they've been successful. Um, some of them may have succeeded because of their sort of tough, gruff ways. Some of them may have succeeded in spite of them. Um, but then they get to this level, and uh, here too, uh, just like Richie Incognito of the Miami Dolphins, these coaches apparently cross a line, right? It's one thing to have a tough coach. It's one thing to have a tough boss. It's quite another thing to have an abusive coach or an abusive boss, and that appears to be that fault line that we're seeing in these college coaching situations, um, you know, where some of the players are coming back and saying that they're getting uh, mental health counseling, you know, that they're sick to their stomach before practices, um, that they're, and some of them are just giving up on the game because the, the coaching is so um, over the top. Uh, that it's just not worth it to them, despite the fact that they've been playing at such a high level, getting a full scholarship because of it, um, and at least prior to that, presumably uh, very much enjoyed the games that they were playing, um, you know, before they ran into those bad coaching situations. So uh, that's part of it. Now, the women's side of it is, is also interesting because... You know, maybe I'm, I'm being a little stereotypical here and, and getting a little um, 
uh, you know, sort of uh, a little bit of a rose-colored lens here. Um, but I, I think for a long time, if you were to look at sort of levels of aggression and sort of hyper-competitiveness, uh, you'd see it more on the men's side in high school and college than on the women's side. And uh, I, I think it's fair to say that in many ways, uh, women's competitive sports at the secondary and post-secondary levels have done a much better job of nurturing the overall character of these athletes and encouraging healthy competition within the context of, of that sport. But now women's athletics, especially Division I basketball, is becoming more of a high-stakes kind of enterprise. And it doesn't surprise me that we're seeing very similar complaints now coming out of the, the Division I women's college side in, uh, in basketball because that is the most high visibility sport. And uh, obviously, again, the pressure to win, the pr pressure to bring the fans in, you know, to be a known program uh, is generating the same types of behaviors and dynamics that we're seeing on the men's side of high-stakes collegiate sports on the women's side as well. So if you're an administrator in the NCAA running a, a big-time college athletic program, what would be some of the things you would do to either vet coaches or change some of the organizational dynamics to help flush some of this out of the system so it's not part of the regular headlines that we're seeing and we can focus on the, the actual fun of sport instead? Oh, boy. Um, that's a biggie because how do you change the fundamental culture of high stakes division one athletics um, when as I said they're really just you know a step behind being you know professional sports operations um, I, I, I think to really change this at a fundamental level you know we almost have to revisit the question of uh, you know what what is division one sports all about um, especially for certainly D1 football for, for men uh, and basketball and uh, for both men and women. Those tend to be where we see some of these behaviors the most. Um, so I, I think there's a, it, it's a big picture question because the little tweaks of saying, you know, get a nicer coach basically, um, they may or may not work, right? Um, and it's hard to tell uh, a college or university, um, you know, don't get a coach who's going to create a winning program for you. Uh, you know, get somebody who's going to create well-rounded men and women when we know that the goal of these D1 sports is to win, right? Um, nevertheless, it is possible to look around the coaching world and to see a lot of coaches who don't act like that. So you have to ask yourself, why did this school attract that type of coach? And why do some of these other schools attract the yellers and screamers and, and sometimes the bullies, right? And, and that has to go, uh, you know, hand in hand with the messages that are being sent down by the university administration, the vetting process for the coaches they're interviewing and hiring. Um, so it really has to be a trickle-down thing. This is a leadership thing that comes from the NCAA as well as from the universities themselves. Uh, that's a little bit long-winded, but it's actually quite a, a, a complicated topic in terms of the different stakeholders involved. And, and is there an interplay here between things like race and socioeconomic class in, in terms of what people allow? And, and uh, let me contextualize this a little bit. One of the uh, videos I use when I teach on the issue of sport, business, and society and, and these types of topics is a video called Year of the Bull, which is a documentary of a high school in Florida football program. And, and if you and I watch this, it wouldn't take us very long to feel like the behavior is ultra-aggressive you have coaches punching young athletes in the face during practice. You have them screaming at them constantly. It's pure fear and intimidation. And I'll play this here in Eugene, Oregon, to, to a fairly homogenous population of students, fairly white middle class for the most part. And many of them will look at this and say, 
that's good coaching. And as we unpeeled a bit, the subtext that we tend to come at, and we've done this now for several years in a row, is a belief that, well, these, uh, these particular football players are coming from such a tough background that they need that level of coaching in order to thrive. And, and if I then say, well, what if this coach were to show up in Eugene and coach the local high school? They say, oh, no way, they should get fired. And it, it piqued my interest in what are some of these interplays, and we're talking about things like bullying around things like socioeconomic class, race, and, and other issues too. Have you found some of this out there in terms of tolerance levels or, or anything else that might be at play here? Mm -hmm. Well, first, that's, that's a fascinating conversation that you folks are having in that class. And, and uh, you know, I was listening closely to how you described your, your students reacting to, to watching that. And I, I think these issues can be relevant. Um, I'm not willing to say that, you know, it's necessarily a blanket thing. Um, but if you're looking for sort of a point, uh, you know, let's, let's say you have some players who, who need discipline. Um, and, and just like anyone else, you're, you're going to find teams, you're going to find workplaces, you're going to find various social settings where maybe some order and discipline is necessary and maybe where some of the participants, um, uh, you know, needed to be guided in that kind of direction. Um, well, discipline and abuse are two very separate things. Now, if you've got a bunch of rambunctious kids or rambunctious adults, uh, it's going to be harder to um, impose or create a sense of discipline um, without seeing, seeming over, you know, over aggressive, right? Um, but on the other hand, skilled people are, are able to do it. And, and maybe the question has to become, um, is, it, is it really necessary for uh, that level of aggression uh, to be exercised towards those kids, or is there a more constructive but tough way uh, to, uh, to, to get them to come together and to do what they're supposed to on the playing field and to, you know, grow up to be, uh, you know, strong, ethical young men and women? Um, you know, that sort of, sounds sort of pie in the sky, um, but, you know, there's just a difference between, you know, the tough coach and the abusive one. And, uh, you know, I'd want to see that tape to, to make my own conclusions on it. But I, you know, would trust your judgment on, on how you're, you're uh, you know, sort of characterizing it. And I'll just say, you know, you have to draw a line somewhere, right? The, it's hard for us to define um, in the abstract that line between you know toughness and bullying but at some point we we cross that line we go over into the side of it being abusive and that's what we have to watch out for and of course a punchline that complicates is it's one of the five winningest programs at the high school level in the entire United States absolutely um, you know that the the lore of sports is filled with stories of hard ass coaches, right? Um, when I was growing up in the '70s, uh, uh, you know, sort of the iconic football coach was Vince Lombardi, right, of the Green Bay Packers, and uh, he, uh, you know, ushered those teams into championship seasons on several occasions in the 1960s. Um, you know, he was known for basically treating all his players pretty much like dirt. Um, but you know what? Uh, while he may have crossed the line at times, um, he earned the respect of his players, right? They, they really came to, uh, you know, care about the guy. Um, and now we're learning also that he was uh, especially attentive to the uh, uh, challenges facing African-American football players and even the small number of players he knew to be gay. So think about that. In the 1960s, right, you had this guy who was, you know, diversity aware, even though he was seen as being this, you know, rough, tough, hard-ass football coach. Um, so in any event, um, you know, that is the iconic model that a lot of people grew up with. In basketball in 1970s, I grew up in, in northwest Indiana, Bobby Knight of Indiana University, right? Throw around chairs, yelled at his players, um, you know, even a player as great as Larry Bird 
um, quit the Indiana University basketball team um, after, you know, X amount of time with Bobby Knight as his coach. And he went on to greatness at Indiana State University. So, uh, you know, Bobby Knight was known as a real rough and tough coach. But then I think he let the worst of himself get just took him over and he just kept getting more and more angry and over the top right and finally he just he, you know he fell on his own sword there and had to leave um, but uh, so you see even within these individuals you know sort of an evolution in Bobby Knight's case in sort of a bad way from you know tough at the edge to crossing that line into being abusive and he couldn't control himself anymore and they had to get rid of him and yet, I imagine finding consensus around where that line is line is is very difficult. If you looked at the Bobby Knight situation after the late Miles Brand facilitated his departure, he had to leave the president's house for weeks because he and his wife Peg had death threats and bomb threats for that termination. So there wasn't any sense that there was a, a you know liberating the community from this abusive basketball coach. Instead, it was. Uh, Quite, quite a bit divide about well yeah those things happen but this is Bobby Knight right and you don't you don't fire Bobby Knight yeah well Josh I I think it's also important to to sort of bring in another aspect of the culture of big time sports and that is uh, to savagely criticize anyone who criticizes these iconic coaches and players right um, you know we're seeing it with the Ray Rice episode where the you know the fans in Baltimore were cheering his you know return uh, despite their knowledge of of his role in the domestic abuse incident that led to him being cut um, we, we saw it uh, with Joe Paterno at Penn State um, so, and, and we've seen it in some of these horrific situations at the high school level where uh, there have been sexual assaults uh, committed by star football players, right? The situation in Ohio. And uh, the people who were whistleblowers, um, you know, basically had to go undercover because of all the threats being directed at them. Um, and, and that's, you know, we see that's sort of a dynamic of aggression that is associated with this win-win-win kind of mentality that we see in in these high-stakes sports programs and you know and I have to admit that it, it gives me pause as a big sports fan uh, you know that that uh, all of us who enjoy uh, watching these games um, nevertheless uh, you know are sort of unwittingly at least part of the support of that kind of a culture right uh, you know if, if we have a favorite division one football team or a favorite NFL team or uh, NBA team whatever um, you know uh, we are um, uh, to some degree uh, facilitating through our fandom um, some of the very culture that can turn around to be pretty darn ugly. Yeah, and it's certainly not why most people come to the stadiums is to cheer on bad behavior, but we get locked in and then we're willing to overlook a lot of those things without a doubt. Yeah, and I have, I think what may change some of that is what we're seeing with the NFL right now with all these domestic abuse situations. I mean, you know, Ray Rice being uh, cut from the team, Adrian Peterson from the Minnesota Vikings being suspended. I think people are having to realize now, hey, there's something more important than sports and whether your favorite team is is you know, going to be in the playoffs or win the championship. And so it, it, it's a matter of balance, right? Because, you know, you, you can have competitive sports situations in, say, Division three college sports, uh, you know, in so-called lesser pro sports, um, and, and take it very seriously as a fan. But, you know, when you get to the point where you're starting to excuse abusive behaviors um, in order to keep that coach or that player uh, on the team, then I think we're we have to look at ourselves and say, you know, boy, aren't, aren't we sort of yeah, encouraging this kind of a culture uh, at the expense of people who are being treated abusively? So, so where does change happen? You're you're someone who uh, runs a whole spectrum, right? You you've done legislative reform. You've gone all the way to the trenches and do coaching and, and organizational change in a very personal way. 
what, where are the solutions? Or is it a whole gamut of them, or or do we need to go top down, or is it bottom up? What what works here? Well, um, I'm not a social worker, but I'm going to put on my social worker hat because if you go to social work school, one of the things they teach you about is systems analysis, right? They, they, and oftentimes they do it uh, as, as families as systems, right? If there's something dysfunctional in a family, it's usually not related to just one thing or just one person. There are all sorts of complex interdynamics. And Similarly, we have systems with organizations, whether they be uh, accounting firms, law firms, retail stores, or college or pro sports teams, right? So the, the answers have to come from multifaceted directions because there's no quick fix with any of this. Um, in my opinion, I do think at the employment law level, we need some law reform to make severe workplace bullying an unlawful uh, employment practice and uh, that goes to the legislation that you mentioned that I've drafted that's being considered uh, in various states um, but that's only one piece of it. Uh, it it takes more enlightened leadership uh, to send the message down y you know what we're gonna play hard we're gonna take our work seriously uh, we're going to hold people to fair uh, expectations of performance but we're not going to treat people abusively. We're not going to stand for that. Um, we need the mental health community to be part of this to help people who've been in situations like this. Um, I, we need the education system to inculcate within all of us uh, some awareness of uh, the costs of treating each other in such savage ways as to uh, be labeled bullying or abuse in some way. So um, there's, there's no one stakeholder that holds all the answers here. It, it, it does take uh, a multiplicity of forces coming together in a good way um, to, to try uh, and, and prevent and respond to these behaviors in an appropriate way. And, and so when your phone rings and someone says, I have an acute bullying situation going on, what, what do you do? What are those first 24 hours and what's the, the weeks ahead look like? Well, I you know, again, I don't think there's sort of a magic approach to um, handling a report or a complaint about a bullying situation. Um, uh, you know, we've both gone to law school and we know that um, uh, one of the first things you want to do is just find out what's going on, right? So I, I think a lot of what we have to do in situations where there's a specific allegation or concern about bullying type behaviors uh, is just to find out what's going on. Um, to learn the lay of the land, to get a sense of that particular organization, its culture, um, what kind of opportunities there are to actually talk to and communicate with people. Um, sometimes the size of the organization, uh, you know, may be significant. Uh, you know, six people, ten people, a hundred people, a thousand people. Um, you know, those those scales matter as well. Um, so I, I, I think, e you know, each situation has to be handled uh, on its own, uh, but with a respect for uh, the facts and the culture of that particular uh, institution. And one, one of the things I've noticed quite a bit in the last couple of years is those looking for help sometimes have a hard time finding it, partly because there aren't enough of you out there, right? There, there are only so many of you folks who have expertise. And so if, if folks are out there and very intrigued by trying to be part of the solution of these types of problems, what, what's some of the ways they can educate themselves to become useful as a support structure in addressing these things head on? Well, if they want to do it internally, there certainly is a lot of literature uh, as well as guidance on workplace bullying. Now, we've, we've, we've made it over that hump there. Uh, you know, the, the Namies, for example, have written two terrific books, uh, one for bullying targets, uh, The Bully at Work, uh, another for organizations, it's called The Bully Free Workplace. Um, and those are just two examples of, uh, you know, volumes that somebody can pick up and read and really get a quick education on what bullying behaviors are about, what they do to individuals and what they do to organizations. Uh, there's plenty of stuff online. 
Uh, I've been writing a blog called Minding the Workplace for the last uh, six years now, uh, in which I write often about these uh, these questions of organizational behavior, how they relate to the law, how they relate to public policy, and how they relate to internal policy. So um, we, we've reached the point where there's a lot of resources out there. Now, if people want to reach out, they can start to Google around. They'll find coaches and consultants. Uh, not a ton of them, but enough to, to be able to identify people who can give them some advice, uh, coach them through situations, um, and provide some guidance on how to handle their situations. Uh, my feeling is that uh, that help has to come from, or, or, or the motivation has to come from within. It's not good enough to say, oh, we called in this consultant, we checked the box, right? We've seen that in other contexts and organizations all too often. Um, the, the commitment to tackle this stuff, uh, to, to create healthier workplaces, has to be generated from the leadership. And uh, I'd say really from the top leadership because even a middle manager or middle level executive is going to have trouble uh, getting uh, his or her organization to take this stuff seriously if there's not buy-in uh, from you know, the executive suite. So um, again, uh, there, are, there are resources out there, but um, it also takes that commitment from within the organization to say, you know what, we've got a problem here. Let's try and create a, a better place to work or play. Yeah, very, very helpful. And any other final thoughts that you'd want to share with our audience as they think through how they can best deal with this, especially in the sports context, mm -hmm. and then and then that'll sort of bring us to the end here as well. Yeah. Well, Josh, I, I think that uh, the work that you're doing and the stuff that we're now seeing happening uh, occurring in some of these pro and college sports situations is kind of dovetailing. You know, this stuff is now becoming public. Uh, we are starting to overtly question it. Um, I, I think we're seeing some pushback against that idea that, uh, you know, coaches are, you know, the complete captains of the ship who can do anything they want to, um, uh, short of, you know, committing some type of a heinous crime. Um, and we may be, we may be at the beginning of uh, at least uh, uh, something of a culture shift where we take these situations more seriously, where we try to balance the excitement, the competition, um, the growth, uh, personal growth that sports allows um, against some of the things that can happen when uh, emotions, attitudes, uh, organizational cultures take us in a, in a bad direction. So, um, you know, the fact that we're talking about this today means that there is some movement on this and uh, hopefully from these very, you know, horrific situations that we're reading about and learning about, uh, we can get some lessons and others will learn from them so that they don't have to uh, deal with similar situations and instead can create much healthier work and learning environments. Well, Professor Yamada, thank you so much. It's been a, a great conversation, very enlightening, and this will be a resource in its own right for us to share out there with folks. And it, you know, I'd love to have you back on as we get a situation we can pull it apart together a little bit too. So thank you so much. Josh, it's been a pleasure, and congratulations to you on all the neat stuff that you're doing. Uh, I look forward to hearing more about it. Take care. Great. Thank you.